You know, I want to... Good morning, guys. Great to see you today, and uh, it is invigorating fall weather. It makes me want to do everything. You know, I want to read a book in the sun under a tree. I want to homestead something. I want to take a trip. I, w- I want to do everything all at once on, on, in weather like this, because I know what's coming, and uh, you know what's coming too. So, Well, I'm excited for today and excited for the journey that we're on. Uh, because we're talking about fortitude, and I need fortitude every day uh, to step into appointments I have, to say the true things that I need to say when it's hard to say them, uh, to to show up and bring energy home with me to my wife. I need fortitude to think about the future and not be afraid of what it might bring. Uh, I need fortitude to just step into the things that grind on me today in the regular Uh, stuff of the day, and you need fortitude as well. It's not always heroic. In fact, it never feels heroic. It feels hard. It's just hard. So here's the definition of fortitude. It's the strength of mind to encounter danger or bear pain and adversity with courage. Not with murmuring and whimpering, but with courage. To keep moving forward, to walk toward the fire. And today we come to a chapter in Joshua... We're looking at chapter 2. It's going to be real easy to follow along because every week we're going to just take another chapter and look at some ways that fortitude comes out of that chapter for us. So today we're looking at Joshua chapter 2, which is one of the gnarliest chapters in the Bible because it asks us the question, is it ever right to tell a lie? Or maybe another way to say it, uh, can I lie for God? Because that's what happens in Joshua chapter 2. I don't know if you've read ahead on the passage here, but it brings to mind some other things about that happen in times of difficulty. Is spying justified? Because a spy is not telling the truth. Is it ever right to sabotage something? What about armed resistance? Is it godly to keep secrets? What about deception? And concealment, or maybe a milder form of confidentiality. What about subversion? There's a whole host of things that come out of this this passage that really aren't answered in the passage. And we need to look at a biblical worldview, a broader way, to figure out, okay, how do we navigate that? How do we understand what's happening in this particular place? And so we just started talking about brave, courageous Uh, strong Joshua and how clear and simple his assignment is to go in and conquer the land and along comes Rahab. There is a house in Jericho. (laughs) You know the song, right? It's been the ruin of many a poor boy. So here we have this passage in in Joshua chapter 2. Let me read you the first seven verses. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, For they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be, be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them in the stalks of flax that she had laid in in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. This is about Rahab and spies and lies. (laughs) So the question is this, does the truth always triumph in our world? That's a hard question to answer. 
And uh, what we're talking about today may not ever be something that you encounter in a warfare situation, but it happens here in this situation. So remember the context here is war. The context here is that that Jericho is the enemy of God. These people are the enemies of God. God has declared, declared war on them, and, and, and they're going to, to uh, conquer this land. And what we have here in verses 4 and 5 is, there's, there's, I don't know that there's any way to get around it. She lied. She said, I, I, I didn't know, you know, I, I don't know. I know nothing, you know. <laughs> I didn't know where they came from. And then she doubles down and says, they went that away and sends the posse off in the wrong direction. So we have, a, we have an issue here of, of lying. It's a little easier to understand it in the King James English because here's what it says. Here's what, here's what Rahab said in the King James English. I wist not whence they were. Whither the men went, I wot not. (laughs) Other theologians have said, this is called prevarication, or improper ingenuity, or a misrepresentation of objective fact, which is called lying. (laughs) It's my truth. Lying is a pervasive problem in our culture. So we don't want to make light of this. 91% of Americans say they lie regularly. They probably lied about that, actually. On the average, men lie six times a day. <laughs> the survey says that women lie three times a day. Oh, come on. College students lie twice a day. 83% of American teenagers teenagers admit that they have lied to their parents. And 64% admit to cheating on a test. And one-fourth of the teenagers responding to the survey admitted that they lied about the survey. (laughs) So, So what's the last lie that you told? It's really easy to shave the truth. It's really easy not to tell the truth. And lying obviously violates the ninth commandment to not bear false witness. And it violates Jesus' instruction to us. It violates the New Testament instruction to disciples to to be truthful. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. So how do we digest this example of Rahab? Because it's never condemned in Scripture. In fact, we see her as an example. And, And yet... Look at our life, and, and I'm not trying to make excuses here or give you loopholes, but I'm just trying to show you how complex our, our, our environment is because not everything is upfront and totally 100% honest and transparent. For example, Joshua wasn't transparent because he sent the spies to spy. So the, the cover story of a spy is all lies. They are not who they appear to be. They have a ruse. They have a, <clears throat> they have a cover story. Uh, and um, that they're, they're lying by their appearance, by, by their whole mission. The wise men at the birth of Jesus didn't tell the whole truth. Herod wanted to know where he was, and they went home by a different way. They simply omitted telling the whole truth. Remember in, uh, in Egypt, uh, Pharaoh said, I want you to kill all the, all the Hebrew babies. They're n- too numerous. And so the midwives came to them and said, well, you know, these, these Hebrew women, they give birth so fast, we can't keep up. They lied to Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh's daughter found Moses and hid him and raised him as her own child. So that wasn't truthful. There's a psalm in David, there's a time in David's life when, when he faked insanity to save his life. Was that true? No, it was a lie. There, there are shavings of the truth in all diplomacy. We, we don't divulge all of our military secrets. If we were really to tell the, the whole truth, we would draw big targets around all our missile silos. Send your bomb here, you know. 
there's, there's not, take this gently now, we don't tell the whole truth when we're selling something. Doesn't mean that we're lying necessarily, but we're not saying, oh, by the way, it'll break down at 50,000 miles or, you know, the, the air conditioner will bomb out, you know, at such and such a place. We don't tell the downside of everything. Obviously, in a military battle, there's all kinds of deception that is used. So remember, the context here is a military context. It's a, it's a, a, a foe that uh, Israel is coming up against. Uh, Winston Churchill said in wartime, <clears throat> he said, in wartime, truth is so precious that she should be attended by a bodyguard of lies. <laughs> I'm giving you a lot of examples here. I'm not necessarily endorsing all of them. I'm just trying to say this is how complex our world is. But Rahab presents us a, a difficult problem because every time Rahab is mentioned about her example, she is lauded for what she did. Hebrews 11, listed with the great uh, giants of the faith, in Hebrews 11.31 it says, By faith the prostitute Rahab... <laughs> Does that sentence fit together? <laughs> By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. In James chapter 2, the great letter that says faith should be matched by works. Who's the example that James pulls out? Rahab. Rahab. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Then Rahab is listed as the great-great-grandmother of David. So as you know, that makes Rahab in the genealogical line of Jesus himself. An incredible story. And so the one thing we we come to at the end of this harangue I'm giving you this morning is there's hope for everybody. God God can use anyone whenever he wants to. So I want to give you two broad principles and uh, I'm aware I'm walking on thin ice here uh, in terms of some of the interpretation of this. So, but I want you to consider this and it's not so that we have excuses for lying it's so that we walk wisely in the world in which we live so number one fortitude walks wisely in a fallen world remember the overarching reality here is that that they're going to war and these are enemies of God this is not out of self-interest or lustfulness that this is taking place so sin has complicated everything sin creates a system of untruth and the scripture and the biblical worldview creates a system of truth and those two things are at war every moment of every day in every occupation and every family the system of untruth and the system of truth Voltaire the uh, French philosopher said this lying is a vice only when it affects evil Lying is a vice only when it affects evil. Now the question is, what do you mean by evil? So here he goes on to say, it is a great virtue when it accomplishes good. So be more virtuous than ever. One must lie like the devil, not timidly and only occasionally, but confidently and constantly lie, my friend, lie. Obviously he was doing that in the context of, of, of a universalism that says, I want to get what I want when I want it, and I will lie to you to get it. So we don't trust Voltaire at all. So let's define what a lie is. A lie is to deny the truth for either out of ego or special interest. I think we use the word way too much in our culture, uh, in the media especially, Uh, Not everything that is incomplete is a lie. Misinformation, genuine misinformation, when I didn't know something and I I say it uh, in a wrong way, that's not a lie. Uh, Making an honest mistake is not a lie. Uh, Incomplete information doesn't mean I'm lying, but there are lies. 
And a lie is to deny the truth that you know to be true deliberately for your own self-interest. So the scripture talks about, Jesus talks to us about being shrewd as a serpent. So just, you know, you think, okay, when you first read this passage, these guys start their ministry in the house of a prostitute. (laughs) Does that sound like a good idea? You know, you're raising support for your mission to to go to Amsterdam and do evangelism. And so the first night you're going to stay in the house of a prostitute. Uh, No, I don't think we're going to support you in that ministry. But this is shrewd. Because where would strange men show up and not be asked for their identity? Where could you skulk into a city with your head down and the bill of your cap pulled low and nobody would ask you where you're going, especially when they know know you're going to the house of a prostitute? These men were going there not to fulfill their lustfulness, but to be as shrewd as serpents to get into the city so they could spy out the city. So anonymity was their key issue. And uh, remember, they were sent men. Um, they, they had a mission. And it makes a big difference about how you live in a, a world of temptation if you are sent and you know what your mission is in that place. I remember the first time I, I was very, uh, <clears throat> I was raised in a, in a very conservative uh, environment and, uh, you know, a, a bar was viewed as a place of evil. And I remember when I was a seminary student, a, a guy who was working with Campus Crusade said, hey, would you, would you come with me? I need to go, I need to go uh, confront a, a friend of mine, and, and he's in a bar. And I remember having some, some little flutters about that. Well, I don't know, if I, somebody sees me going into this bar, what are they going to think? But I realized, you know what, we're going in there, we're sent in there. We're not going in there for the purpose that the bar has. We're going in there for the purpose that Jesus has for us. So there are many situations where we may not understand why you're there, but you need to know why you're there. And we confront these all the time. We need to be as shrewd as serpents, and the purpose makes all the difference in the world. Here's a, here's a basic principle that I'm operating on, and we have to be very careful where we apply this. But here's the principle that I think is part of our shrewdness as serpents. And that is that the enemies of God, the genuine enemies of God, have lost all claim to the truth. Here's what I think Rahab is doing. Rahab is lying about a fact, but she's actually defending a greater truth. Now, be very careful about what I'm saying. I'm not talking about situation ethics, where you have the right to lie about your product so you can make money to support your family. That's not what we're saying here. We're talking about what we're later going to define as a borderline situation where, where basically the facts are being extracted from Rahab under threat and coercion so that something evil Genuinely evil can be done. These men would be killed. So it's like, like what happened with Corey Ten Boom. Are you hiding Jews in your closet? What are you going to say? Well, you're supposed to tell the truth. And of course, the deceiver, the, the enemies of God will say, you're a Christian, you need to tell me the truth. Which basically then is a, a straitjacket that puts you in a box because they want to do evil with the fact that you're going to tell them. So I believe that in those situations, those borderline situations, to defend the greater truth, you don't speak truth about the fact, or you withhold something. You, you don't speak the whole truth because it will bring genuine harm, not to your ego and not to your self-interest, but to someone's life or the truth itself. I think that's what basically... Uh, Rahab is doing. You cannot play along with the masquerade that this evil intention uh, be be nurtured by you telling the truth about a fact. So, for example, a totalitarian interrogator, a tyrant, a torturer does not deserve to know the truth about facts. Like, who else is in on this? That type of thing. 
the Nazi stormtroopers, you know, along with Corey Ten Boom and people like Rahab, the Gestapo did not deserve to know the truth about what you were doing to get people out of Germany at that time. Um, so it's a deceitful appeal to truthfulness to make truth a weapon to hurt people. I don't know if that's as clear as I can be. Now, the question is, when, when is that a godly act of faith? Because it isn't just when you feel uncomfortable and it isn't just when it's going to cost you a little money and it isn't just because your wife asks you, do I look fat in this dress? <laughs> There's no answer to that question, by the way. <laughs> This is not out of self-interest, and that's the key issue we're talking about here. And, and you've heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who ultimately said, you know, um, you know it's, it, he, with, with, uh, with much trepidation, he became part of a spy network to, to assassinate Adolf Hitler. So everything he was doing was untruthful on the fact basis, but in his mind, in his conscience, it was the right thing to do to save the nation and to save truth, to save, really, Western civilization. And uh, there's some questions about that. Um, but nevertheless, that's what I think is happening here. We need to be shrewd as serpents and recognize there will be, here's a, here's a sentence that's really hard to digest, there will in this sinful world be conflicting absolutes. And the, the, the best example to keep in your mind is, are you hiding an innocent person in your closet? Are you hiding a Jew to save his or her life? That's a conflicting absolute. You, you're, you're supposed to tell the truth, but you're to, to defend life. These are both absolutes. In a world that's so twisted and broken, sometimes those come into conflict. And we have to be very careful that we, that we don't make excuses. Uh, I think men, most of us will never be confronted with this kind of conflicting absolute. But we are, conf we are confronted every day with tough choices. There are, there are perhaps borderline situations. We call them borderline situations. And uh, most of us will never confront that. But we do have some tough choices. For example, confidentiality. When, when do you keep a confidence? Uh, especially if, you're, if it's between a husband and a wife and the husband has told you one thing or the wife has told you one thing and the other one really wants to know. Do you withhold? Well, most of us who are involved in the, the people industry, if you want to call it that, would say, you know, unless it's life-threatening, unless it's endangering somebody's life, I, I'm not going to tell you the truth I'm not going to disclose everything that I know. What about insurrection? And I'm not, not talking about what we've called insurrection on January 6th. I'm talking about genuine resistance to tyranny. Would it be okay to fight in an underground army? Basically to live as a deceiver in the daytime and to fight as an insurrectionist at night. If food becomes scarce, which it might, would you participate in the black market? Um, is it okay for Christians to go into China under the guise that they have a business there? Yeah, and they have a little business, enough to keep the government off their backs. <clears throat> but what they're really there for is to be spiritually subversive to the culture to bring the gospel. Is that okay? Um, what if you're in the military and you're given an immoral order? Of course, the great excuse at the Nuremberg trials was, I, hey, I was just following orders. What if you're giving an, given an unethical pressure in your work that violates your conscience? When do you step up to that? Is it okay to hide or help people escape or forge document, documents to protect the innocent in warfare? All these questions 
We live in a broken system, and sin has complicated everything. And we see that in stark contrast here in the, in the book of Joshua with Rahab. So if I've gotten you totally confused at this, and uh, maybe you're thinking up excuses for the lies you're going to tell today. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope you're seeing this is, there are all kinds of ways that total transparency and total truthfulness is not used every single moment of every single day. However, there are these borderline situations where I believe Rahab lied about a fact to, to basically enforce the system of truth, which is saving the lives of these spies. Well, the second principle here is that fortitude invests in hope because God loves this world. And the first thing I want to say here is I need to preach the gospel to myself every day. Because often we feel tainted or soiled. Uh, we, we feel that we've been sucked into something that could be used for evil. We often don't know exactly what, what, what is the work I'm doing today. What's it contributing to? So, for example, let, let's say you, you design software. We're only one or two steps away from whatever you do being used for evil. So you design software that could be used by pornographers, you know, tomorrow. Um, what if you give out prescriptions? You're a pharmacist. And, uh, you know, that, that could be used to stoke somebody's addiction. You're doing something truthful, but it's tainted. You sell somebody a car. And they're going to drive drunk uh, and kill somebody. You preach a perfectly good, clear sermon. (laughs) And somebody comes back to you later and misquotes, not only misquotes, but misquotes the intention of that or uses it on someone else in an unfair way. Scripture itself can be used one step away from its intention for an evil purpose. So every day I need to preach the gospel to myself. Lord, I know I sin. I know I'm living in a twisted and broken world, a world that's smelly, a world that is difficult and complex. And maybe I've even given advice or helped somebody walk through something and I'm not sure where this is exactly going. Lord, I just need your grace every day. Um, and, and even like the spies, maybe I've even been sheltered by a system that I detest. (laughs) I took the COVID money. Didn't you? Even though I feel like we're spending our way into oblivion. I'm tainted. You know? Anyway, there's a lot of things here that um, we could think about. But let's just, let's end on a positive note, okay? (laughs) Okay. Because what we really see here is that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. Because really the story here is not so much what Rahab denied, it's what Rahab confessed. And here's what it says in verse 8 of chapter 2. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan. To Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Rahab is making one of the clearest confessions of, of, of uh, conversion to the Lord God himself. She's saying, we've heard about all this. Somehow a testimony had come to her. Now she's met the men, and she knows that, that the Lord is coming. He's right at the door, and she's bowing the knee to the Lord Most High. So no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. And the, the goodness of this passage is that Rahab came to faith in the Lord himself 
uh, through the fear that she was feeling and the testimony that she heard. And so we never know. We, we just never know how when we stand for the Lord, when we simply speak his word and we represent him, how he's going to melt the hearts of the people around us. And I'm going to ask you that question as you go to your tables. Who was the person, and maybe it was you, that you thought is way beyond the reach of the gospel? How can you be any further from, from the reach of the gospel than a prostitute in Jericho? And God reached this woman and brought her to faith. And maybe there's something in your life that you are needing to confess that, you know what, um, I've been... I've been trafficking in untruth, but it hasn't been for any kind of noble reason at all. It's just been because I've been afraid of the consequences. And I need to confess that. I need to come back to the Lord in grace and say, today is going to be different. It's going to be a day of fortitude in a corrupt world, and I'm going to stand in the Lord's strength for the truth and not for the lies that are all around me. So, guys, you have something to talk about, I think. So let's talk about these questions around your table. Uh, Give everybody an opportunity, uh, and uh, let's go. Let's go deep.